2012 is a year that will live on in infamy. It was the year of Gangnam Style, the 2012 election in America, and it was the year that the world was allegedly supposed to end. While the world at large didn't erupt into a fiery blaze, to fans of the Paper Mario franchise, that's essentially what happened. Paper Mario Sticker Star marked a new era of Paper Mario, one which was heavily criticized and loathed by longtime fans, who desperately hoped that when the time would come for a new installment, it would pay tribute to the legacy of the Paper Mario series and return to its roots. Fans wondered what would come next. What would a new game in the series look like? Would Nintendo listen to fan feedback? When would we see a new installment in the series? In time, those questions would be answered. And once again, the series would be encased in yet another controversy. 2012 was the year of Sticker Star, but arguably, it's also the year that Nintendo's greatest failure was released. That being the Nintendo Wii you. And if you were a Nintendo fan while this thing was on store shelves, you probably look back with some degree of embarrassment. Contrary to popular belief, this wasn't a mere add-on for the Nintendo Wii, but was instead its successor. One which failed to sell even half of what its competitors Sony and Microsoft were able to achieve with the PS4 and Xbox One respectively. It was a failure by all accounts, even by Nintendo's own admission. Of course, with hindsight, we know that Nintendo was eventually able to pull themselves out of this dark period with the Nintendo Switch, going so far as to port nearly every first-party Wii U exclusive to their far more successful follow-up console, saving these games from obscurity and allowing a new audience to partake in some of the best experiences that the Wii U had to offer. But there are a handful of games that remain prisoner to this platform, and the very last of these games to be released is the particular subject of today's retrospective. Today, we are going to talk about the swan song to Nintendo's greatest failure, Paper Mario Color Splash. Hello, and welcome back to the Paper Mario series retrospective. I'm JJ, but you can just call me Lady Zillennial. And if you're new around here, wow, it has been quite a journey getting to this point, but I would absolutely recommend going back and getting caught up on all my other Paper Mario retrospective videos if you haven't already seen them. Because today, things are gonna get a little crazy, and context would definitely be helpful. There's also gonna be spoilers for Paper Mario Color Splash, if you care, so you've been warned. In the last video, we acquired the fourth Paper Heart, corresponding to Paper Mario Sticker Star. Somehow. Now, only two hearts remain. The ones corresponding to Paper Mario Color Splash and the Origami King. Because of my rocky history and now indifference towards Sticker Star, the only way I was able to get the green heart was through some interdimensional shenanigans. Which feels kind of anticlimactic, doesn't it? Something about this heart feels off to me, but I'm not in any position to question the logic of this. So what this now means for me is that I truly need to dig deep and find some love for the next two games. But here's another pressing matter. I've been reading through this book, the one that started us off on this quest in the first place. It's supposed to have a lot of answers to my questions, but honestly, it's just raising more. For example, in this passage, it talks about the six paper hearts, one of darkness, and five of light, which would imply that I only have a single paper heart left to find, since Sinister Dude already had the dark heart. If that's the case, could this retrospective be the one to end things? Either I need to talk about both games for this paper heart, or Color Splash is our final stop, which doesn't feel right to me. Either way, it's not like asking questions is going to get us to the end of this retrospective series any faster, so we're just going to get a move on and see what happens. We've got a real doozy of a video ahead of us today, but actually, before we can talk about Color Splash, oh no, no, no! In 2015, the Nintendo 3DS would receive yet another Paper Mario game, sort of. Mario & Luigi Paper Jam was exactly what the name would imply, a crossover between the Mario & Luigi series and the Paper Mario series, Nintendo's two titans of RPG spin-offs, something that 
on paper, should be fucking awesome. Ugh. Look, I don't want to spend any more time on this than I need to, especially since I consider it to be more of a Mario & Luigi game than a Paper Mario game. One day, in the future, if I ever cover the Mario & Luigi series, I'll give this title all the time and attention it frankly doesn't deserve. But to be blunt here, my main problem with this game is that they kind of butchered the concept. Rather than borrowing from the vast majority of worlds and unique traits that define each of these two series, this is instead the most surface level and bare bones representation of the two games that you could possibly imagine. Many of the issues which afflicted Paper Mario Sticker Star, and to a lesser extent Mario & Luigi Dream Team, which as far as I know is considered to be one of the weaker Mario & Luigi games, made themselves apparent here. And yeah, to be clear, the version of Paper Mario represented here is the Sticker Star iteration. Paper Jam's gameplay is… fine. Better than Sticker Star by a fair margin, I think. And the graphics are pretty neat. It's just… man, I feel so empty when I look at this. I haven't played every game in the Mario & Luigi series, but even I know that there's so much lacking here. And the Paper Mario side of things is especially disappointing. Poor Paperboy feels like a third wheel. Paper Luigi doesn't even show up. Like, why not? He was in Sticker Star, you could plop him in there somewhere. Three years after Sticker Star, and this little fart of a game sure is forgotten about these days, isn't it? Well, at least this one has experience points. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit too harsh on it. It's far from a bad video game, and I would definitely take this over Sticker Star, but yeah. That's all the attention I feel like giving Mario & Luigi Paper Jam for now. So let's jump ahead a year, shall we? The year is 2016, a time that I don't look back on very fondly. Beyond cringing at the person I used to be at this point in my life, and remembering that election cycle in America, this was also a significant turning point for me, graduating high school and starting college. This very much overshadowed anything that was happening in the realm of gaming, especially since I wasn't able to bring my Wii U with me to my freshman dorm. But that being said, I was still casually observing the shit show that was Nintendo in 2016. It was March 3rd of this year, exactly one year before the release of the Nintendo Switch, that a particular Nintendo Direct aired, and out of nowhere, in the most unexpected way imaginable, a little nugget was shown. What? And this time, in Paper Mario Color Splash, the theme is colors and paint. What? As such, the game takes place in a colorful paradise called Prism Island. What? But something is very wrong. What? Prism Without any build-up, or really any hype, Nintendo announced the next game in the Paper Mario series, and this reveal caught everyone off guard. It raised a lot of questions, the biggest of them all being, would this game fix Sticker Star's biggest issues? Fans held out hope, but many could see the warning signs signaling their greatest fears. A world map, a card battle system that looked a lot like the sticker system of the previous game, this almost indifferent and matter-of-fact way in which the game was announced, and a single partner character who looked to be playing a role similar to Kirsty from Sticker Star. At the same time, there were signs that Nintendo may have improved some things. Nevertheless, it was clear that the game would be building upon the foundation set by Sticker Star, which is the polar opposite of what longtime fans were hoping for. Emphasis on longtime fans. You have to remember that Paper Mario Sticker Star sold 2.49 million units, making it the best selling game in the series after Super Paper Mario, meaning that more people played this game than the Thousand Year Door or the Nintendo 64 game. So a lot of people got introduced to the series through Sticker Star, and a lot of casual players with no experience playing the other games in the series enjoyed it. So to them, Color Splash looked like it would be more of what they already enjoyed. Assuming that they owned a Wii U and even knew about this game's existence, it's fair to say that at this point, the Paper Mario fandom split off into two camps the classic purists, 
and the modern fans. There was definitely some overlap, but for the most part, there was some really weird hostility between the two camps at their most extremes. Classic purists were understandably upset that the series they loved changed in a way that took away what they fundamentally loved about the series, and some of the more hardcore fans despised the idea that anyone could ever think the newer games were any good and would constantly bring up the Thousand Year Door at any opportunity. Then there were the modern fans who got annoyed that the classic fans wouldn't shut up about attacking the thing that they maybe enjoyed and grew spite for the Thousand Year Door because they couldn't set foot anywhere online in the Paper Mario fandom without hearing about it constantly. Once again, there was overlap between these two groups and most were normal about their opinions and letting other people enjoy what they like. These are just some of the more extreme examples. Ever since Sticker Star, Paper Mario discourse has been not very fun, let's just say. And boy howdy did Color Splash set off a new wave of discourse when it was announced. I'm sure you're all sitting on the edge of your seats wondering what I think. I mean, it's clear that I'm more of a classic fan. I don't know if I'd call myself a purist, but I do love classic Paper Mario. But I also didn't play the Thousand Year Door until more recently. I got my start with Super, which I loved at the time and grew to be more mixed on. I loved the first game, I enjoyed the Thousand Year Door a similar amount, though I was definitely more critical than your average fan over certain aspects of the game. Sticker Star was a game that I just flat out considered to be bad, largely because of its gameplay not feeling very fun or enjoyable to me. Paper Mario Color Splash was one of two games I hadn't played prior to making this retrospective series, the other one being The Thousand Year Door. And since I already covered The Thousand Year Door, this is the final game I need to play in order to be able to say that I've experienced every game in the series. And with this information, I could figure out my place in this war that has raged on between the Paper Mario factions, if anywhere. I've heard a wide variety of opinions going into Paper Mario Color Splash, many saying that it was a massive improvement over Sticker Star, the best of the modern trilogy even, with others saying it's about as bad, if not worse. But now that I've played it, what do I think? I wish I could answer that question, but my god, I beat this game and I have no ah! clue. I think both camps are kind of right. I don't know, this thing is a bit of a mess, and I don't really have a firm position here, at least not as of right now. So why don't I just describe my experience and piece together my thoughts and uh, you know, we'll figure it out as we go. Let's do this. We boot up the game and find ourselves on a title screen with some cute little animations. Hitting start boots you directly into the game, meaning that there's only a single save file. Yeah, not a good impression right off the bat, but putting all that aside, we transition into a pre-rendered cutscene with a bit of spooky atmosphere. Peach and a generic Toad, who very much should have been Toadsworth, arrive at Mario's house. They show Mario a toad that has had all of its color sapped away. On the toad's body is a return address, which leads to a place known as Port Prisma. The three set off as the title appears. Upon arriving, the place appears abandoned and desolate. Mario messes around, opening a fountain at the center of town, and meets Huey, a floating paint can who starts off as a 3D model, but flattens himself out to give Mario some paint that he can use to participate in battles and beat up the local Shy Guys. We soon learn that the town is missing its paint stars, magical stars that are the source of color in this land. So Mario and Huey set off across the nearby areas to collect them. With each new paint star, flashbacks of what happened back at Port Prisma are shown, revealing that Bowser was the one responsible for everything happening. You go through the motions once more, defeating every boss and acquiring all six of the paint stars. Once all have been found, Mario summons a rainbow which leads directly to Bowser's castle. Eventually, the game culminates in a final boss fight against Bowser, who, while he does actually get to speak in this one, has very little to say, and what little he does say is under the influence of evil magic paint. After defeating Bowser, Huey decides to stay behind so that he can magically sap up all of the dark paint. 
After doing so, he goes away, and his fate is really ambiguous. I don't know if he died or if he just wanted to get the hell out of this game, but uh, okay, bye. The residents of Port Prisma celebrate with Mario and friends, and that's the gist of the story. I definitely glossed over some finer details, and to be fair, there's perhaps a bit more to chew on with this game compared to Sticker Star, but on the whole, in terms of overarching narrative, this game's story is still not especially strong. Being better than Sticker Star, but paling in comparison to the other games in the series. Though, as we'll touch on soon, a strong story was never the mission of this game. Things were off to a promising start at first, especially with the game seemingly paying homage to The Thousand Year Door, but once again, much like with Sticker Star, the game was forced to limit itself to pre-established Mario characters, and this is where we need to acknowledge that article. In July of 2020, right around the time that Paper Mario The Origami King was released, a VGC article was published which detailed an interview with producers Risa Tabata and Kensuke Tanabe, describing the approach to development with Paper Mario games following Super Paper Mario. There was quite a bit here, but the most important takeaway from this article is that while the devs were fully aware of fan outcry and what the criticisms of modern Paper Mario have been, they have stubbornly asserted that removing elements that were beloved in the earlier games was not only crucial to innovating with the Paper Mario series in the newer titles, but that doing so would increase mass appeal. From this perspective, it was believed that things like story and unique original characters and RPG mechanics were a detriment to the series, when if you ask any fan, those specific things are precisely why so many people fell in love with the series in the first place. So when talking about Sticker Star, Color Splash, and Origami King, it's important to note that these were the constraints that the games were developed under. As mentioned in previous chapters, it's been a long-running rumor that Club Nintendo surveys for Super Paper Mario had a direct impact on the more infamous direction that the series would eventually take. And if it is true that less than 1% of survey participants actually liked the story, resulting in this dramatic shift in later games, I find that quite tragic. Especially since we could infer that the average survey participant either didn't care about being honest about their opinions, or were more casual players who, because of the Wii's unprecedented success, bought Super Paper Mario thinking it would be another 2D platformer, and didn't care about all the text at the beginning. It's got Mario, why do I have to read? Other games within the Mario universe did suffer under this corporatization and emphasis on marketability, of the most bare-bones Mario things, but Paper Mario, for whatever reason, was the series that got hit the hardest. Even mainline Mario games like Super Mario 3D World and New Super Mario Bros. U, for as basic and milquetoast as they were during this period of time, had freedom to introduce new worlds and character designs. For some reason, Paper Mario simply wasn't allowed to be like the games that the majority of fans loved. Nintendo was forcing it to be something entirely different, which doesn't necessarily mean that the game in question will be an objectively bad product, in theory, but these conditions inevitably result in a fracture within a fanbase. There are multiple layers to the behind the scenes stuff with the modern Paper Mario trilogy, but the quote that I'll end this section on is the rather infamous one where Tanabe said, Since Paper Mario Sticker Star, it's no longer possible to modify Mario characters or to create original ones that touch on the Mario universe. This line alone gives us enough context and provides a good framework to now look at these games and take them for what they are. Color Splash in particular, at least in the case of today's video. This game does not invent any new characters, aside from Huey, who's just a paint can. What the quote is saying is quite literally, hey, you know how in the older Paper Mario games there were all these cool designs for characters that made the Mario universe feel more alive and fleshed out? You're literally not allowed to do that anymore. Sticker Star is where this is arguably felt the most, but Color Splash is very much afflicted by this restriction. And look, some of the most important and influential games were designed around constraints and limitations. I just don't see why the new ideas have to come at the cost of elements that have been beloved from the start. Why can't Color Splash have cards and painting, but 
also have partners and original characters and a fun story. We can all coexist here, it's fine. If a dev is willing to put in the extra time and effort to craft a Scrimblo Bimblo as a random NPC, I don't see any reason to not let that happen. And I read the damn interview that went over why they're not allowed to do that. It's clear that Color Splash wants to pay homage to the series' roots, but isn't fully able to realize or lean into that beyond a few passing references. The start of the game is very reminiscent of The Thousand Year Door, and much like that game, we get to once again explore a world that's not the Mushroom Kingdom. And in a game like this, I'm grateful for that at the very least. Port Prisma has similarities to Rogue Port, but it's more… how do I put this? gentrified? It's mostly Toads living here. Yeah, character designs are still nothing to get too excited about, as Toads make up nearly every NPC once again. Though Shy Guys are also a lot more common this time around. This time, there's slightly more variety with the different outfits that Toads can wear, so it's sort of a half-step in the right direction. The bosses in this game are no longer basic enemies that have been hit with the Get Big Ray, but are instead the Koopalangs. Yay! So, the Koopalings are a controversial choice to be sure. They were first introduced in Super Mario Bros. 3 for the NES, and then appeared once again in Super Mario World in 1991, and were completely absent from the Mario series until 2009 when New Super Mario Bros. Wii brought them back. And at this time, it was pretty cool seeing them return, but in the years since they were reintroduced, they just would not go away for a good stretch of time and having them be the bosses here feels like a bit of a cop-out. Though we'll talk about them more when we get to combat. They have a lot more personality than Sticker Stars bosses, I'll give them that. Plus it's cool seeing characters who we've never seen in Paper Mario being brought over to the series, which is exactly what I wanted more of given the already existing limitations of this series. It's just still not quite what I would have preferred. And now I'd like to touch back on the story, which as I said earlier, isn't much deeper than Sticker Star's sequence of events. And that was by design, as mentioned in the article I spoke about a moment ago. That being said, there's quite a bit more dialogue in this game compared to Sticker Star. And while nothing in the story hits hard or endears me to any of the characters to remotely the same extent as any of the first three games, Paper Mario Color Splash's script does have one ace up its sleeve. It's got the funnies. Keep quiet or else I'll… well, I've already locked you in jail. There isn't actually much worse I can do without raising the game's age rating. Aw, the shy guy's so nice, he's just trying to help me out. Mario, you asshole! That toad is naked. From now on, no more straws for anyone. Drink from your mouths, people! Uh, who am I kidding? I can't outlaw straws because then only outlaws will have straws. That toad has seen some things. Oh shit, he's got a straw. Oh, I get it. It's P.T. Piranha. That's funny. You know, a friend of mine told me that their headcanon for Bowser's motivation in this game is that he wants to steal the rainbow because he's trying to be a good ally to his gay son. Hey, speaking of which, where the hell is Bowser Jr.? <laughs> This game is all about putting together the rainbow, so you know we've got to have some queer representation. Can I get a Birdo in the chat, please? Hey, uh, shy guy? What are you doing down there? Uh, is that shy guy doing what I think he's doing? Uh, is that why there's white spots everywhere? For the love of God, do not take a black light to Port Prisma. Am I in the middle of a boss fight? with a steak? You know, that reminds me, I need to go have lunch, so uh, I'll be right back. Paper Mario Color Splash is full of wacky stuff. So much wacky stuff, in fact, that I'm barely scratching the surface and I think the comedy is much needed in a game that doesn't have much else going on in the story and characters department. 
Some people didn't vibe with the fourth wall breaks and internet meme lord jokes that NOA's localization team added in the English version, but I had fun and didn't mind them one bit. Even when I wasn't laughing, I was at least amused, and that's a big win over Sticker Star. Still, this is a far cry from what the classic fans wanted, but for me, I'll take what I can get. And being the funniest game in the series is better than being the game with the least story. Getting down to business, we now have to get into the gameplay, and oh boy, so the battle mechanics. Sure are something. What we have here is essentially an evolution on Sticker Star's system, which in my opinion was so fundamentally flawed that I would have personally just scrapped the whole thing altogether and done something different. But no, it's back. And to be fair, quite a few changes have been made, but are they enough? I don't think so. In Paper Mario Sticker Star, all your actions in battle are stickers. Paper Mario Color Splash replaces stickers with cards, which fundamentally serve the exact same function. And that's the root of many of the issues that I have with it. In the lead up to release, many hoped for a deck building system and gameplay style that felt more in line with it. Imagine literally any other RPG with cards and decks. Uh, sorry, I don't have a lot of experience with these kinds of games. Point is, there's nothing fundamentally different about using cards instead of stickers. The core elements of Sticker Star System are all here, but with a lot of minor tweaks here and there. God, where do I even begin? Okay, so for starters, attacks are performed, as I said earlier, using cards. Only the process of using them in battle is a lot more tedious, as the game tries to make use of the Wii U gamepad. Oh, I almost forgot about you. So in a typical battle, you'll sort through your cards and select the one that you want. But sometimes you'll have cards that are in black and white, so you'll need to decide if you want to color them or not. Fully painted cards deal more damage than black and white cards, and you can choose exactly how much paint you want to add to a card. The roulette from Paper Mario Sticker Star exists, but it has been changed so that you don't pay for more actions per turn, but rather it's used as a way to get an extra card if you happen to be running low which probably won't happen very often since the limit is 99 cards. You start the game only being able to use a single card per turn, but as the game progresses, the default increases at set increments in the story and maxes out at four cards per turn, which honestly, I think is more preferable. What's not preferable is the fact that once again, you can't see enemy HP. Sticker Star made the baffling decision of combining every enemy's health into a single combined number, but Color Splash doesn't even have that. Enemy HP is represented by how much color they have, which does visually indicate how much damage you've done, kinda. It's practically impossible to gauge just how much damage a particular sticker will do in a scenario. A card that'll take off half of an enemy's health will only take off like a tenth of a different enemy's health. This leaves you to do a lot of guesswork, and the consequence is that you end up throwing away a lot of cards because it's better to lean on the side of caution. The system is both more complex, yet a lot more simple at the same time, since you don't have to manage badges or partners or anything like that. I don't even know how you would integrate partners into a system like this, but yeah, once again, they're not here. And that's kind of sad. There are cards that can be used to summon allies, but their effects in battle are minuscule to say the least. On a more positive note, the game kind of has experience points. Sort of. After battles, enemies will drop these little hammers. Collecting them adds to a meter in the top left, which gradually levels up your hammer, allowing you to hold more paint. And paint is kind of important. Paint is used in the overworld to fill in colorless spots, which is a good way to stock up on new cards and is also necessary to open up certain paths and activate certain things in the level. Paint also serves a function in battle being a resource that's depleted whenever you color in cards. I don't really have many issues with paint as a system, as I think it remedies the feeling of battles feeling pointless in Sticker Star. Now you at least kind of have an incentive to partake in battles, and they give you a bit more player choice when deciding how and if you should use it when selecting cards. Actually using paint? Yeah. Oh dear god. So here's what a standard turn in Paper Mario Color Splash looks like. You look down at the Wii U gamepad, you sort through your cards, you then drag a card that you want to the top of the screen, manually hold down on the one that you want to paint, and then flick them up to actually use them in battle. You do it once or twice. 
it's nothing to get upset about really, but doing this for every single action in every single battle gets really damn annoying. To make matters worse, all cards are laid out horizontally, and since you can hold up to 99 of them, you see where this is going, right? You'll sometimes have to spend a lot of time tediously scrolling from one end of your deck to the other to get the specific card that you need. And for as much issue as I had with Sticker Star's inventory, I consider this to be a lot more preferable to Color Splash's system. Granted, cards in Color Splash are the same size, so you don't have to worry about fitting them into your scrapbook, but I would have much rather just had access to more of them at the same time on my screen. There's a lot of real estate on the Wii U gamepad that's just not being used. Or, better yet, why not give us menus like the classic games, or at least give us a menu shortcut to quickly jump to subcategories of stickers like attacks, defense, and healing. In Classic Paper Mario, you pick jump, and then you pick the type of jump, and then you choose which enemy you want to attack. A feature that once again does not exist here, forcing you to only attack the enemy at the front. Let me pick jump, and instead of bombarding me with every single card of a particular attack I have, just tell me with a small number, how many I have. There's no need to clutter things this way. I get that this feels more like holding a deck of cards, but it's not at all intuitive. And using the stylus to sort through them just causes even more frustration since it's easy to accidentally shift them around. And I personally don't like switching between holding the Wii U gamepad like a controller and having to whip out the stylus, in conjunction with having to constantly shift my view between the TV and the Wii U gamepad. The game does have an option to use buttons for these functions, which I do appreciate, but it's a feature that you have to actively seek out. The game doesn't tell you how to do it, and you're still forced to hunch down and snap your neck to look at your cards on the Wii U gamepad, so only some of my grievances are addressed here. Let me tell you, as a content creator, I have beef with the Wii U gamepad. There's no way to record footage of it, so for the purposes of showing you what the hell's going on, I had to bring this game over to CMU Emulator, and it was here that I discovered the most ideal way to play. So if you're playing the game on CMU, and you set the game to off TV play, then only use the gamepad and switch to buttons, you've got a much better control scheme, and you only have to look at a single display. Nintendo, why didn't you just let us play this way? Playing this way is a much better and more streamlined experience than playing with the Wii U gamepad. Still flawed, very, very flawed, but better. Although to be fair, I only got like a chapter in because if I'm being honest, I couldn't stomach a second playthrough immediately after my first one. It's such a shame that in an effort to justify the Wii U gamepad as a controller, Nintendo made many of their games far less functional. There were certainly games that used this controller well, and I like that my Wii U allows me to get footage of DS games that use a stylus, but by and large, any time I need to use the Wii U gamepad for this game in particular, I got extremely annoyed. And that applies to the cutout technique as well. Cutout. More like, they should have cut out this feature. <laughs> we'll be right back. Cutout is this game's replacement for Sticker Star's Paperize mode, and it's both more tedious, yet less tedious all at the same time. God, I am sensing a pattern with this game. It's more annoying because you have to wait for the screen to shift down to the Wii U gamepad, grab the stylus, trace the outline, walk from one end of the screen to the other, put the stylus away, and then you can get back to the action. This exists in tandem with the return of placing cards, stickers if we're talking about Sticker Star, in the environment to solve puzzles. Things are back. That is a line that I wrote in a video script. Things function just like they did in Sticker Star. You find them in the overworld and convert them into cards, which can be used as both attacks as well as in these cutout puzzles. These have been improved in a few ways. You no longer need to sling them in order to convert them to cards. They just get converted the moment you find them. There's less of them overall to keep track of, and the game actively provides hints as to where you can find the remaining ones. Replica cards also exist, meaning that you can have multiple of a particular thing card in your inventory at any given time. 
These are intended solely for battle, as attempting to use them in a puzzle context will get you disappointment. These do kind of break the balancing of the battles even more, since you now have a lot more of the most powerful attacks that exist in the game available at any given time. But hey, if these help to make battles shorter, who am I to complain? All right, well, that's quite a few improvements. Sounds like this aspect of the game is just better, right? 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 Damn it, game. Why can't you just let me enjoy the things that you do better? Paper Mario Sticker Star's general design of needing specific things in order to progress is back. And once again, boss battles have specific requirements. You can't beat them unless you have the correct thing card. Fortunately, the game does a better job of making sure that you know what you need before going in. In fact, it kind of does too good of a job. So then the puzzle becomes figuring out how and when to use the thing card. And the most frustrating moments I've ever had playing any game in the series happened during this game. Knowing which specific turns you should use which thing cards for is where it goes from puzzle to just trial and error, especially when boss fights start requiring multiple thing cards. It's all about performing the very specific sequence of events that the game wants you to perform. And look, I hate to be the person that comes in with the Thousand Year Door did battles better, but like, the first two games had one key advantage, and that was badges. The existence of badges in older games meant that players had freedom to decide how to go about battles. There wasn't necessarily a specific right or wrong way to do things. In those early games, maybe you equip a bunch of RNG-based badges and let the game decide your fate. Or maybe you emphasize defense. Perhaps you equip badges that let you charge up for a really strong attack. The choice was always yours, and there was never an inherently wrong way to play. Partners then added another layer of choice and strategy. With a few key exceptions for specific moments, you could largely pick a favorite partner and stick with them. Okay, again, there's technically partners in Color Splash, sort of, but like, these don't count. You can't even use them during boss fights, are you kidding me? Here, in Color Splash, you have to do things exactly how the game expects you to, sure. You have some freedom when it comes to building your deck and deciding which cards you want to carry, but as long as you buy stronger cards when they become available, that's it. There's not much strategy or freedom. Miss your window of opportunity, then you'll either die or have to wait a few more turns to try again. And let me tell you something. The steak, the fucking steak is easily the worst offender. I refuse to believe that there is a single living soul out there who managed to beat this on their very first try. And if you comment on this video saying that you did, I call bullshit. You're lying. Don't do that. The game just throws a steak at you and says, cook this f why don't you? And you just have to figure it out. There's no risk of losing all of your HP for this boss fight. You just have a strict three turns to quote, cook the perfect steak. How do you do that? Fucking, I don't know, figure it out. So what the game expects you to do is to use your hammer cards to tenderize it. But don't tenderize it too much or you'll ruin it. But also if you don't tenderize it enough, then uh, you'll also ruin it. You then have to use three specific thing stickers in a very specific order. Salt and pepper, then grill, then lemon. And if there's another turn left, you have to make sure that you don't touch the steak. At one point during the tenderizer phase, I used a flame hammer, which burned the whole thing and led to an instant defeat. I've had far more game overs in Color Splash than every other game in the series combined. And look, maybe some of this is my fault. I'm willing to accept fault for my occasional little fucky wucky. I definitely like calling myself a gamer, but I'm human. For a good chunk of my playthrough, I was bedridden with some kind of sickness that made me a little miserable, so I probably wasn't in the best headspace. But regardless, I experienced a lot of confusion, trial and error, frustration, and a constant need to consult a guide throughout my Color Splash experience. This reliance on a guide also extended to overworld exploration, which, yeah, the world map is back, and this is kind of confusing. A world map makes sense for a portable game, which emphasizes shorter play sessions, 
Bringing it over to a home console game, however, doesn't feel as well thought out of a choice. Though there are a few notable improvements and changes, as one would hopefully expect, level icons display the number of exits available, and areas of interest will be directly indicated, which matters a lot because progression is kind of wonky. There are different areas and worlds of sort, but levels are no longer numbered and you don't stay in one place for the entirety of a chapter, you'll end up darting from one end of the map to the other on a regular basis. This creates an illusion of the game being less linear, but in actuality, it's just as, if not more linear than Sticker Star, since key areas are blocked off until you defeat the corresponding boss. The game, broadly speaking, does a pretty good job of guiding you in the right direction, but sometimes this method of progression can make things a bit more confusing. As progression can sometimes feel a bit more obtuse, much like Sticker Star. I did in fact complain about backtracking in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, and both Sticker Star and Color Splash sure do love making you retread familiar ground over and over again. Each chapter is linear. But there is more variety, at least in the early sections, and the environments themselves are a major step up from the stock default biomes found in Sticker Star. You'll still visit more traditionally themed areas, but they have more distinctive flavors this time. The grass area is still pretty basic, but has this fun windmill level. The desert is a fusion of various desert tropes and has some pretty distinct locations. The beach area is more piratey and has a distinct purple look to it. It's made even more special by an alternate reality version that looks unlike anything we've ever seen in Paper Mario. I also enjoy the forest area and how it culminates in a circus, which is a really good fit for the series. I also have to commend the modern trilogy for, at the very least, retaining a game show of sorts that Mario has to participate in. Sniff It or Whiff It was a fun little distraction in one of Sticker Star's weakest chapters, and that same game show returns here. Which, uh... You know, I didn't like it quite as much in Color Splash, though that's probably because I didn't recognize that I had to buy specific cards that I needed to play this game from a shady dude in the corner near the start of the level. And my inventory was so full that I had to get rid of a lot of cards to make room for the new ones. Ugh. The game being underwater was a cool twist, I suppose. We also have Rochambeau, which is just rock, paper, scissors. Not too exciting, though it can be manipulated to score some major coinage, and you'll find quite a few of these coliseums spread across the map. There definitely could have been more done overall, but I will gladly take what we have in terms of new and unique locales. It's actually comparable to the first game in the series in that regard. So good on you, Color Splash. Good on you. Good on you. I feel... Very conflicted right now. One moment I'm praising the game, and the next I'm tearing it apart, and the cycle continues. What's even happening to me? Well, why don't we cut to an ad break, and I'll gather my thoughts. Paper Mario Color Splash is a better game than Sticker Star but it's also a worse game than Sticker Star. Yeah, this game is complicated and confusing, but I felt both of those things while playing the game. In a lot of ways, this is to Sticker Star what the Thousand Year Door was to the original game. It does a lot of the same, but more, and is much better, but has lower low points and more things that frustrated me. There are some nice smaller things like a toad that gives you hints, Paper Eyes not activating unless there's actually something there you can use it on, the comedy, the added personality to the locations, and the other quality of life features, but then we run into things that make the experience more frustrating. Not only do we have many of Sticker Star's frustrating design choices, but a whole host of new things as well. Sorting through your inventory in battle, painting feeling like attacked on mechanic, then there's the way thing cards are so heavily integrated, confusing progression, these goddamn Kamek fights that randomly pop up and make things way more annoying by altering battles in ways that inconvenience the player. The addition of Rescue Toads, who, while fun to find, are annoying in that they act as MacGuffins that gate progression until you track down each and every one, which only really serves to pad the game, etc, etc. But then, I suppose, at least I felt something. 
The game truly is a roller coaster ride of emotions, and that roller coaster happens to look visually appealing. One thing I certainly can never bring myself to complain about is the game's visuals, because hot damn, is this game pretty. The Wii U isn't known for its graphical prowess, but the way intelligent systems manage to craft such a gorgeous and detailed world through means of really good texture work and lighting has to be commended. This too, however, much like Sticker Star, is an aspect of the game that's rather controversial, and once again, I feel like the ire and hatred many hold towards this visual direction stems from the game itself not having as much going on outside of its gimmicks. Though Color Splash certainly has a lot more to offer than Sticker Star. So it might be a small visual detail, but Mario having a white outline is kind of despised by a lot of people, and while I can take it or leave it personally, I can understand why it doesn't vibe with everyone. Frankly, I didn't see it as necessary for readability, though I could be way off base here. Most of what I iterated in the previous chapter applies here, so where I'm gonna leave this is, ooh, game pretty. Sad that it has to run at 30 FPS, but you know, it is what it is. So, about the soundtrack. This might be a surprise to hear me say, but I'm actually really conflicted about it. Much like Sticker Star, there's this big band sort of jazzy feel to the soundtrack that isn't anything quite like the original games, which used more synthesized sounds. This game uses live instruments, and they sound very good. But this game's feel is very different from Sticker Star in one key way. It feels softer, as in there's not a lot of punch to most of the songs. Like, this soundtrack is perfect, if you're trying to wind down for bed. Let's use the battle theme as a comparison, because if I play Sticker Star's battle music and then follow it up with Color Splash's version, I think the difference will become quite clear. Yeah, for a battle theme, it doesn't really get me hyped up. I mean, it's a bop, don't get me wrong. This is a catchy ass song, but it feels more chill and low key, which when you take into consideration how long it takes to execute a simple attack, maybe they made the right call here. That being said, I quite enjoyed a lot of the tracks, but this lack of punch, in a sense, this soft energy, made for a soundtrack that I don't revisit nearly as much as I do the other games, even though a lot of the music is really good. I like using Color Splash's soundtrack as background music. Again, it's good, a lot of good stuff in here, but a lot of it feels one note, and that's especially felt in the boss themes, which, again, feel too soft. And that's especially egregious when it comes to the final Bowser fight. It's easily my least favorite final boss theme in any Mario RPG that I've played, which I guess when there's as many games as there are, one of them has to be at the bottom, but this is the one that claims that spot, so I'm just letting you know. Color Splash's soundtrack does have some variations on its default battle theme, including a chiptune rendition that plays in this Mario Bros. 3 inspired level that sort of brings back Super Paper Mario's 3D flip mechanic and uh, kinda does it better, not gonna lie. We've also got some dynamic music in the form of the world's map theme, which starts basic, but gets more fleshed out as you collect paint stars, and I'm a sucker for that kind of dynamic music. So this is the obligatory part of the video, where I play some musical highlights before the discussion wraps up. You can skip to the timestamp on the screen if you just want to wrap things up.
Uh, what? What? Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I was um, I was taking a nap. This soundtrack is just so chill, so lackadaisical. This game's whole vibe is just, yeah, things happen. Let's crack a few jokes. Why take things so seriously? Yeah, Paper Mario Color Splash is a game that exists, and I think that's likely going to be its legacy. Unless you're in the camp that despises Color Splash more than Sticker Star for cementing this new era of the Paper Mario series. Honestly, I don't know. I have so many issues with Color Splash. Like, a lot. Arguably more than Sticker Star. The most hated game in the series. And being sick while playing this game was a real poopy time to be alive. Being sick while editing this video, also very frustrating. But, looking back, I can at least say that I felt like a changed person at the end of it all. There were more than a handful of elements that I found enjoyable. They were just buried in a sea of questionable design choices. I can see why this might be someone's least favorite game in the series, but I can also see why someone might really enjoy it. Did I enjoy it? I mean, sometimes, and more consistently than I did Sticker Star. If nothing else, beating this game was the only thing standing between me and being able to get the full picture of the Paper Mario series and claim that I've beaten every Paper Mario game. Not you. Go away. I don't think this one will ever get a remake or a port, especially with it being the lowest selling game in the series. But much like the console that this game belongs to, it's a bit of a tragedy. I wish I could extract the good emotions from this game and be able to experience those whenever, especially if I can do that without having to dig out my Wii U. But it is what it is. Unless you happen to have a Wii U, it looks like Simu Emulator is going to have to be the go-to way to play the game. In a sense, I take pity on this game. I see it. I see a hot mess. And I can't help but empathize. My feelings about this game will probably be different if he asks me again in an hour, but the point remains. I felt something, but is this enough? Will this be what I need to say in order to summon the next paper heart? <gasps> there it is. The blue paper heart. Now I have five. Could this be what I need? Have I finally found them all? No, I don't think you have. That voice. It's you. Sinister dude. Oh, good. You recognize me. What have you done with my friend? Come to think of it, how did you even find me? Well, you see, I've known your location ever since you found the Dark Heart. And now you've gone through the effort of finding the blue one as well. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Excuse me? What do you mean I found the Dark Heart? Silly girl, I'm referring to the heart that you didn't earn. Why don't I show you? Hey, that's mine! I... I don't... understand. Of course you don't. I put this heart in the chest. I knew exactly where you would be. How? How could you possibly know that? Easy. The Dark Heart told me everything I needed to know. OCC! JJ, I'm... I'm sorry. Cece, what did you do to them? Oh, nothing at all. This is who they truly are. Are you saying they were the Dark Heart this whole time? Eh, something like that. Hey, let me go! No, not when you've collected most of the paper hearts for me. No, <laughs> I'm close to having everything I need. Why are you doing this? Can you at least explain to me? Are you really just a bad guy doing this for the hell of it? I would never. You might think I'm evil, but I'm just serving justice, getting revenge on those who have wronged me. Your little friend Cece isn't the saint you think they are. You're both pretty awful now that I think about it. Little Cece didn't even have the guts to tell you about their crimes. How pitiful. No, no, I would never. You're the one who- Silence. I've had enough of the both of you. With the full power of the Dark Heart, and now four Light Hearts, there's only one left to find. And once I have them all, I can remake this world without either of you two. And you are going to help me. 
And why would I do that? Well, it's either that, or you fade out of existence. You do know that, right? If you don't talk to your silly little YouTube audience for long enough, you'll cease to exist. Wait, you know about my viewers? I do. And if you refuse to cooperate, maybe I'll leap out of this screen and do a number on them too. Just for kicks. So why don't you think it over? I've got all the time in the world. I don't know. What do I even do? All my hearts are depleted. All of them except... JJ, I hate to have to ask you to do this, but it's the only way. You need to use the dark heart. You'll set me free, and I can get you out of here. I promise. But what will happen to us if I use it? What even are you? I have so many questions. Do you trust me? I... I want to. I swear. After this is all over, you owe me an explanation. I need to know everything. Okay, fine, I promise. Just hurry. We need to act now. Okay. Hey, both of you, no talking. Wait, you can't be serious. Do you have any idea what you're doing? Not exactly, but here goes. Wait, please, no, don't. So this is the power of the dark heart. <coughs> and to think it could have all been mine. <laughs> I did it! I've won! I'm back. What have you done? What happened to Sinister? Vaughn, reduced to atoms. And in just a moment, you'll be... Uh, uh. No, I can't. JJ, you have to leave. I, I can't fight off this corruption much longer. What? No. No, I just got you back. I'm not leaving. If you stay here, I'll kill you. I'm not asking nicely. I can't let myself hurt you again. I... No... JJ, Lady Z, please, don't let me become a monster. Cece, I'm coming to help. No, you're not. Goodbye. Not again. Why does this keep happening to me? Where the hell could I possibly be now? Hell, now that's a good guess. Who's there? Where am I? Apologies, madam. You're not from around here. It would appear that you found yourself in the Valley of Repressed Memories. Your memories, to be precise. Judging by your appearance, you met a grisly demise, and your game has ended. Demise? No. No, that can't be. I... I was so close to finishing my mission. I can't be in a place like this right now. Easy. Easy there. You should get out of the fields before the horde of the undead arrives. I live in the mansion up on the hill. Why don't you come find me, and I can help you make sense of what's happened. I guess I've got nothing else better to do right now. Um, hello? Stand right there. Excuse me? Where's your voice coming from? Apologies. I've gone by many names throughout my centuries of existence, but you can call me Walter. Something about you seems rather familiar, but we won't dwell on that. Uh, wait a sec. Are you the painting? Yes, indeed. And it gets awfully boring staying fixed to this wall. Would you believe that I hardly get any visitors? Well, I'm rambling. I sense something about you. 
a strange energy. Is it possible that you're not alone? I don't think I brought anyone with me. Although, weird. It looks like I still have the paper hearts. They're just dead. Ah, paper hearts. Yes, five total. And one you. Hmm, I see. I'll tell you what. I might just have a way to help you return to your home dimension, but I'll have to ask for a few favors. For starters, I'm going to ask you to deposit those paper hearts, as well as your hat, into the drawer beneath my portrait. Why the hat? Just do as I say. In the drawer, you will find a pair of glasses. By wearing these, you can assume a form that will prevent you from fading away. And yes, I'm well aware of the mysterious beings that lie beyond the fourth wall. Halloween is right around the corner, you know. So I'm going to ask you to talk about something spooky from your childhood. Do that, and you just might be able to find a way out of here. Okay, well, here goes nothing. Huh, this form feels nice, yet familiar. Well, you've had a long day, so why don't you get some rest to continue fusing with your new form? And we can continue this in the evening. Spoilers, it's always evening here. But, yeah, I'm really tired. Cece. Even though you quite literally tried to kill me, that's not going to stop me from finding my way back to you. I'm going to figure out whatever's happening, and I will help you. You're just going to have to wait a little bit longer. Until then, don't do anything too reckless. Hey, so it's been a while. I hope you're doing well. So the video is now over, but of course we're on YouTube and I haven't uploaded in months. So I should probably give you all a quick little update and some shout outs to some really amazing folks, including you, the one watching. Thanks for doing that. Whether you've been keeping up with the series or decided to jump in with this video, in which case you're probably really confused about what the heck was happening in the last 10 minutes. A big thank you to all my wonderful patrons who have been waiting patiently for this video to release, and I would like to give a special verbal shout out to Laura Flynn and Psyche Clips for being in the Elder Zillennial tier. Your support means a lot. I also of course have to give a very warm thank you to Fox Cinder and Garen Seho for lending their vocal talents to this project. I truly could not have brought this project to life without your help. And lastly, a big thank you to all the artists who made art that appeared in this video. Credits to all them are on screen right now. Links to their socials will also be in the description. Okay, time to update all of you. So for some context, this video was originally planned to release in September of 2023. That did not happen, which means that all of my subsequent plans had to get reshuffled a bit. I was planning to segue into a couple of spin-off Halloween themed videos before concluding with the final Paper Mario by the end of November. But as you all know, the holidays are over, but that's not going to stop me from still making those videos. Because you know what? I can be spooky any time of the year. So the next video is going to be a short and sweet little project all about horror themed games from my childhood. That's going to be followed up by a retrospective video discussing zombie media from the late 2000s and early 2010s. After that, we'll be back on track and should in theory have that Origami King video out not long after. However, I do have a couple of other projects lined up for April that do take priority, so we'll see what happens. Either way, I am grateful to all of you for continuing to watch and support me. The last few months have had some of the highest highs and lowest lows that I've ever had to deal with. And God, it feels good to be back. <laughs> Subscribe if you want to see more of my stuff. Do the Patreon if you want to support what I do so I can maybe turn this into a job someday. And join our Discord server if you want to chat with some really cool peeps. I hope your 2024 is off to a great start. Thanks again for watching. Huh. You know, it kind of feels like there's something I'm forgetting to acknowledge. Hmm.